Amen. So before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Uh, I've got a picture of, it is an ancient uh, marker of a rooster. Some said this looks like a roadrunner. So I want to make sure you know this is a rooster in Palestine, and it's on a wall, and with that arrow, it's there. And I, I took liberties with Photoshop, and I added the three little uh, sound noises to it to make it the rooster's crow. That's the title of the lesson, the rooster's crow. But this is an ancient depiction of a rooster because the arrow is pointing to the site where they say that Peter denied Jesus three times. What well, we just heard in our reading, that Jesus said that he would do so. And, uh, and, and I, I wanted to give maybe a background to this. Just a few weeks ago, before our Mission Sunday Focus, we talked about that God uses a softened heart. But the ops, opposite of that is Satan uses a hardened heart. That he is able to get a foothold to be able to use that heart as a weapon, as a tool, in order to tempt uh, for us to even give in. And we talked about how Judas allowed Satan to enter his heart. And I mentioned briefly about Peter and his denial. And so I want to pick back up from that focus and look at Peter's denial, but from an interesting location, looking at the rooster's crow. And what's interesting about the rooster's crow, about the, the context of, of Peter denying Jesus, all four Gospels include this, this account. And so every one of them gives something just a little bit different to help enhance our understanding of what took place on that night. And we're going to allow those differences to provide us with our points. But when I think about a rooster's crow, I don't necessarily go to the garden. Uh, in fact, one time I was preaching in Selmer, Tennessee. I was a youth minister, and so it was a rare opportunity for me to even preach at that time. And, and so uh, I, I get up there, and, and I remember saying the phrase, and the Lord said... And that's when someone's phone went off, and it was as loud as it could go. And it's, I said, and the Lord said, and it went, ur, 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 ur. And, and I said, no, that is not what he said. And, and, and it, you know, but really today, you could say, yes, that is something that he said, because Jesus had an awful lot to say about the rooster's crow. But that, that really did happen, so maybe let's put it on silence so that doesn't happen again. But anyway, just this idea of, of really a sign, an ancient sign being placed on a wall to point to the site where it, where it was, or where they believed the location was, obviously they saw it as important to remember the rooster's crow, but also, I'd like for you to see this picture. My dad just came back from, from Israel. He was there, I think it was a, a month and a half ago. And uh, in fact, he took this picture. This is a picture of, a, it's, it's an old church building that has been put on the site where they believe this took place. And in fact, in 1000, in 1000 AD, a church building was built, and then it was destroyed, and this was put in its place. It's still extremely old. But if you look at this picture on the left side, it is a depiction of Jesus, and he's holding up three fingers. So it actually has to do with our scripture reading of Mark 14, 26 through 30. But we didn't read verse 31. That has to do with the right side of the door, where Peter is saying, no, no, I will never deny you. And so Jesus is, obviously, it's important for us to remember it's been even put as a relief on a door of a church building on the site where they say this took place. Well, the picture behind it is also a picture my dad took, and this is right down from where that, that uh, rooster or roadrunner is it, that is pointing to the site, because they know that it was, the site was Caiaphas' personal home and the courtyard where he lived. And so this, they believe, is the cobblestone staircase that led to Caiaphas' house. And so this most likely is John 18 and verse 15 beginning. If you'll turn there with me, we're going to read a few more verses of John 18, 15. But this is John's account of, of uh, the denial of Peter. All right, so John 18, 15. It says, Simon Peter followed Jesus... And so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. 
Again, the court of the high priest, this is his home. This is Caiaphas' home. And so these are literally the steps where Peter would have followed. Isn't it great to see something that we just read? And so it, it establishes the location. But it also establishes some importance. And we're going to allow the rooster's crow to give us four main points for this lesson. In the first place, it fulfilled prophecy. It fulfilled prophecy. Uh, Jesus said it would take place, and it did. So we just read 15. Let's, let's go through verse 17. Verse 16 says, But Peter stood outside of the door, so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. That servant girl is going to be important in just a moment. But this disciple who knew the high priest, he's realizing Peter is outside that door. It's not the same door that's there, but it reminds me of it. And he opens the door and he says, come on in, I got you in. But that means it's bringing Peter into the courtyard, the very courtyard where Jesus is being interrogated. This isn't the courtyard, but imagine this is where Peter is. And imagine Jesus is on the other side of this podium. He's in the same courtyard. He can see Jesus. And we'll look at that in just a moment, evidence for that. And so remember I said that this servant girl would become something of importance. She said, the servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of his man, this man's disciples, are you? When she says this man, she could easily be pointing at him. He said, I am not. <laughs> now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. So why is he standing and warming himself with these, these men? Well, they've just been in a garden at night, because we remember they, they came, Jesus, he says, why have you come at night with, with pitch, with not pitchforks, with clubs and lanterns and torches, right? Why have you come at this time? And so here they're taking, they could have taken one of those torches and they could have caused this fire to start. And that's where he has gone from what we just read, singing a hymn with Jesus in the garden, to now standing and he is warming himself with the very people who just apprehended Jesus. Talk about finding himself in a place that he doesn't want to be. I'm sure Peter is terrified of what's taking place. I'm sure he, his stomach probably turned at the thought of saying, hey, I got you inside. I would rather be outside. He's trying to sit there and figure out what to do. He finds himself with this crowd that has just apprehended Jesus. He's with the wrong group of people. And what's interesting is we've got to skip this section of 19 through 22 to get to the, 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 uh, the next two uh, betrayals, denials. And so let's, let's read in verse, verse, let's see, 25. It says, now Simon Peter was standing and he's warming himself. There's that same fire. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? And he denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? That's how we know that this group of people are those who have apprehended Jesus as all the apostles left. Peter had cut off the servant Malchus's ear, and he's saying, this was my relative. I know your face. I saw you cut off my cousin's ear. He's going to remember. You see how that proves that he's with the wrong group of people. Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. So we have the rooster's crow was a fulfillment of what Jesus had said only hours earlier. But what's going on at the same time as Peter's standing and he's warming himself and Jesus, he's over here on this other side. And we, we can read in 19 through 22. Actually, I'm going to go all the way through 24. But verse 19 says, The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I've spoken openly to the world. I've always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together, and I've said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. What's interesting, one of them has been asked three times. At the same time, Jesus is being asked about his disciples. And he's saying, they know what I said 
But Peter's denying that he ever heard him. He, Peter's denying that he even knew him. He's even inviting curses upon himself, we'll see later on, in this denial. So Jesus is, instead of answering the high priest right away, he's giving him, why do you ask me? Look at 22. When he'd said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Right, so we have Annas and we have Caiaphas. And and this is, we understand the house of Caiaphas, where he's even being interrogated, and now he's been slapped across the face, all while Peter is denying Jesus. So the rooster's crow fulfills prophecy, but the rooster's crow was also a way of escape, a way of escape. If you will, let's uh, look look at 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. We're going to be going through verse 13, but for this moment, 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 is he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. Can that describe Peter? Because remember, we, we were looking at Mark 14, and we went through verse 30, but we missed verse 31. Verse 31 says, after he's been told he's going to deny, he says, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. Some say, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me thrice. But he said emphatically, if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. We know the rest of the story. We know that Peter denied him. We know that all of the rest denied him. They all left his side. He says, I will not deny you. In fact, in another time, he even says, Lord, I'm going to, I would die with you gladly. That's when Jesus told Satan, to, told Peter, to get behind me, Satan. Because he was telling, he, Peter was telling Jesus, you're not going to go to the cross. You're not going to die. Not on my watch. Well, we realize on Peter's watch, he would fall asleep. Peter didn't understand. But Peter here is saying emphatically, I will never deny you. Does that not apply to he who thinks he stands? Take heed lest he fall. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. So it's he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall, but there is no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Does that not apply? All of the apostles have left Jesus as well. So the temptation was to deny Jesus. And I realized I went to this. I'd like for us to go to Luke. I went to this a little earlier. I'd like for us to go to Luke 22, Luke's account of this very quickly. So maybe put a bookmark there, unless you didn't before you turned. Okay, so Luke 22, 31 says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. See, in Mark 14, 38, just seven verses from the place where Peter says, I'll never deny you. Jesus says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You're about to be tempted. He he mentions the word temptation. Luke brings out more about what that temptation looks like. Satan is demanding to have you that he might sift you like wheat. I've mentioned this before in a Bible class where uh, during during the, I guess it was 2020, when it was kind of challenging to find flour. You remember that time? And uh, see, Mary had just purchased a mock mill, and it's an attachment for your KitchenAid mixer that you can, you can mill oats or you can mill your wheat berries and make your own flour. And I was thankful for it because of that. We were actually able to find wheat berries in, uh, you know, like 20-pound bags. We were able to find that. But if you don't have the mill, you can't really, you know, can't really use that. But what was interesting is sometimes we'd go through the, the wheat berries, and I found this little, you know, I found these pieces of the wheat that were not supposed to be in there. And some of you know that's the chaff. It's the hull that the wheat berry comes in. I mean, we all, we, all, we know about sunflower seeds. When you go to put sunflower seeds in your mouth, you crack them. What do you spit out? Well, if you, you're going to spit out the 
the, the outer hull, the husk, and eat that goodness on the inside. It's the same as the wheat berry. So what sometimes, in order for us to, to make sure that, that those seeds were ready before she ground the, the flour, I would take some of those seeds and, 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 uh, that had the husks in them, and I would pick them up. I remember hearing about that's how they used to do in the first century. So I said, well, I'm going to try it. And the, the husk would fall to the side. The chaff is what it's called. It would float to the side, and the wheat berry would be in my hand. And I could separate the chaff from the wheat. I could sift the wheat. That's what this is talking about. So Satan's perspective for Peter is that he is the outside husk, that he is the part that needs to be thrown away, that he is the chaff. But Jesus' perspective is that he's the seed. He's the goodness that's within. And and in fact, um, let's see, I turned back to 1 Corinthians. Let's see. Uh, In verse 32, so Satan, Satan is trying to demand Peter from Jesus, and he is wanting to sift him like wheat. But he says, but I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. When did Jesus pray for Peter? It's in John 17 when he's praying to the Father and he prays for those whom God has given him. He's praying for the apostles. And he's saying, he's trying to sift you like wheat, but he is saying, don't let your faith fail. I've prayed. What a, imagine Jesus saying, I've prayed for you. He says, I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. If after the denial, Peter's faith fails... He's no different than Judas, and we know what Judas did. Jesus has given him an incredible assurance. He's saying, I'm praying your faith won't fail, and when you've turned again, he's saying, because he's already told him that he's going to deny him, but he's saying, I've prayed that you're going to turn again. He's telling him, I've prayed that you're going to repent. He is referring to Acts chapter 2. He's referring to when Peter would turn again and preach the greatest sermon that it would establish the church. And so we, we see here, let's see, let's keep going in, uh, in verse 33. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you even know me. The fact that Jesus is on this side, Peter's over there, and he's, 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 he's warming himself by that fire And he is saying the whole time, I don't know the guy that I'm seeing across the courtyard. Jesus said that's going to take place, and it did. So that gets us back to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. How was the rooster's crow a way of escape? Well, verse 13 is, No temptation is overtaking you except that is not common to man, but God is faithful. And he'll not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he'll also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That word endure is why this is so important because this verse can be maybe a, a, a slap in our face when we've, when we've denied, when we've fallen short. Because I understand the way of escape. I mean, you look around, exit, 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 exit. I see the ways of escape in this very room. And it's nothing to just walk through it, right? The doors are open. You can walk through the exit. And he's saying he'll provide the way of escape, but it's that you'll be able to endure. And so sometimes we've got to walk through the way of escape, and we've got to continue to walk through the way of escape. We can't ever get through the way of escape and say, well, I'm out of the temptation zone. I, it's over. The temptation is, is, is all good. No, if, that's, if we do that, then he who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You know, if we think that we will never deny Jesus, we say, no, I've made the decision. I'm never going to change my mind. And we never have to think about it again. Then we're not going to see that way of escape because we don't realize God has faith in us and we've got to continue to have faith in him. We've got to continue to have faith in him. We've got to continue to endure all of the temptation that, that, that Satan sends our way that when we are lured and enticed by our own desire, because that desire, it, it, uh, it brings forth sin. When sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. We're told not to be deceived, my beloved brethren. James 1 and verse 16. So 1 Corinthians 10, 13 it explains that we'll have a way of escape 
when we don't think we stand. Peter is the one who said, I'll never deny you. He missed the way of escape. And the rooster's crow, I submit, is that way of escape. If you'll turn to Mark 14, our main passage, Mark's account is the only one that differs, actually brings a little bit of a, a difference that is, man, it's significant. It's significant. Verse 66. And Peter, and as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out in the gateway, and the rooster crowed. The ESV brings out, and the rooster crowed. There are some uh, manuscripts, some copies of manuscripts that, that actually don't have that phrase within it. And it's, it's, it's interesting. Some have said possibly it was because the copyist was trying to make it to where it, it married up with Matthew, uh, uh, Luke, and John when they were copying it. Because if you keep reading, remember we saw in verse 72, immediately the rooster crowed a second time. There is no question that it was the second time that the rooster crowed. And so it's interesting, the rooster crowing after the first denial, is that not a way of escape? See, he had been told that the rooster is going to crow. And, and why would the rooster crow? Think about it. This is Caiaphas' house. It's in the courtyard. What's the significance of a rooster running around the house? Well, we're so far removed from that, except we live in St. Clair County. My neighbors have roosters. They're not in their house. They are close to the courtyard, though. They would be like that. They're outside. And what's interesting is very, very possibly that rooster is supposed to, is going to be the meal for Caiaphas that night. But Jesus had other plans for that rooster and his crow. If you see here, he's saying he's going, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. So that first rooster crowing could have easily been a reminder, a wake-up call for Peter to say, whew, yeah, I just heard the rooster call. You know, just a couple hours ago I heard that a rooster was going to crow, I'm sure glad I just heard that rooster because I'm not going to deny him ever again. But he denies two more times. See, he didn't hear the way of escape. Why? Because I'm never going to fall. I will never deny you, Jesus. And yet he finds himself warming himself by the fire with that group of individuals who have literally just apprehended Jesus. One of them even had tried to cut off his ear. He thought he could get away with it because of the cover of night. Why? He missed the way of escape. In fact, I'd like for us to to keep uh, keep reading. It says, verse 67, And seeing Peter warming himself, he looked up at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse upon himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed the second time. That second rooster crow is some have thought that that's at daybreak. And that's the moment that rooster's crow is the most pronounced. Sometimes you'll have a rooster's crow that is a warning or, you know, something is trying to get into the hen house and they will, they will do a call of warning. They'll, they'll crow any time. But this is that final one. And that was literally the wake up call. The rooster's crow was a wake up call. And I, I submit that that the rooster that God created in the garden, that's the first alarm clock that man has ever had. That a rooster was crowing in the garden. You think about it, that's what the rooster is there for. And, uh, and I remember when, uh, when we lived in, in South Haleville, my dad preached for the South Haleville Church of Christ. We lived in the preacher's house right next to the building. Well, right next to us, there was a man that had a dozen roosters. Not one hen, only roosters. 
And uh, you'll know that, that uh, it's only roosters because they're all in little individual cages. There'll be a metal roof on top of it, maybe corrugated metal. And, uh, and so they've got to be separated from each, from each other because they're all going to fight. Because they want them to fight, but only when they're paying, when they're betting. And so that's actually what took place. One day I was outside, I was maybe eight or nine, and I look over, and there was, uh, there was the owner and se- several of his friends in a circle, and, uh, and they were throwing two of the roosters at each other. And again, I didn't know what they were doing. I went in, I got my dad, and I said, Dad, I said, Let's come out here. And he's like, get inside. Call, he called the police, and all of those roosters weren't there the next day. And in fact, I, just, I didn't even establish this, but when you have 12 roosters, you never hear the end of the cock a doodle doo it's, 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 it's constant. There is no sleeping. It is a wake-up call. And, and I think about that. You know, we didn't have the wake-up call after they were taken away, but Peter sure did. I believe he came out of that sinful coma that he was in when he heard that final rooster crow, and he realized what he'd done. But not only does he have the sound of the rooster that is the wake-up call, he also has something that he sees. Remember where he is. He's warming himself in the courtyard, and he has to look across, and he sees Jesus. Look at verse 55 of Luke 22. And when they'd kindled that fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. All right, and so then the servant girl seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, this man also was with him. Now, we're going to go on to verse 60. But Peter said, this is the third, man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him before the rooster crows today, you'll deny me three times. I wonder as he's sitting there and he's warming himself by the fire, he looks up when he hears the rooster crow because he's just, uh, he's just invited a curse upon himself. And he sees the face of his Savior. <laughs> I wonder what his face, I wonder the look on his face. And there's conjecture behind this. But what we read from John is we know that he most likely had a bruise across his face. A bruise across his face because he's just been slapped by an officer, but he realizes now he's been slapped by me because I denied him. And that's when Peter goes away sorrowfully. That's when Peter weeps bitterly as he went out. Possibly down the same cobble steps that he had entered by. I wonder how many of those cobbles have been, have been completely watered by those tears as he left that location. It was a wake-up call for Peter. But the thing is, it's a wake-up call for you and for me. It's not, not that it was. It is a wake-up call. If you will, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Because Peter's example needs to be remembered in the same way we need to remember the rooster's call Because in the same way, we're going to be tempted, and we need to see the ways of escape. But we're tempted when we're in that circle. You know, notice they sang a hymn together, right? Did we sing some hymns today? Yeah, we sang some hymns together. At At the first service, we sang some hymns together. But they're already outside and they're, they're with other groups and who, who knows what takes place. He's with this, this group and he, he's with the apostles, the followers of Jesus, and they're singing him. They're worshiping together. And now he finds himself a few hours later in the courtyard warming himself with the deniers, with the people who have literally taken Jesus by force. And we can find ourselves in the same situation. Hebrews chapter 10 And verse 20, uh, let's see, I've got 23 up there. 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You see, we have a confession of hope, and we can waver. We can go from, from, from this group with Jesus to this group with the world, and we can waver back and forth, and if that takes place, what happens? 
Verse 24 says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. I'm sure those people were having to stir up that fire to keep it blazing. But if he was with the group with Jesus, he'd have been stirred up to love and good works. There's this picture of when we're together, we are literally reminded of the love of Jesus. We're reminded of the grace of Jesus. Notice it says, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This, if this is referring to judgment day, then when we're gathering together, we're stirring up one another to love and good works, to remember why we're here, to serve God and, and to serve Him when we're outside of, of being together. Then he says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. He's saying we can go on and sin deliberately? He said, when we do neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some, and we're not encouraging one another as the day draws near, then we're going to sin deliberately. Because he's saying for. For is indicating directly what he's just said. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. I wonder, as Peter was warming himself by that stoked fire, that that warmth got a little hotter as he's looking at Jesus' face and he's realizing what he has done. We need to realize when, we're, when we find ourselves in that situation where we have, we're in the wrong camp and we're, 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 we're surrounded by the wrong fire, that there is a fury of judgment. It's there. Then he says, verse 28, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who spurned the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? He's saying we can outrage the Spirit of grace by simply just saying, I'm going to deny being with Jesus and he's just going to let us. He's going to let us choose which camp we're going to be in. He's not going to force you, and he's not going to force me. But the point is, I can outrage the Spirit of grace and will outrage the Spirit of grace when I deny Jesus. But God be praised for the mercy of God. Because I believe that face that, that Peter saw, you know, some have said, well, maybe, maybe the face that, Jesus, that Peter was seeing on, on Jesus was a, a look of, of, my friend just slapped me. I can take an officer, but my friend has just slapped me. You know, but based on what we read when he says, I've prayed for you that you will not lose your faith. And then he's, he's, he's saying, but turn and strengthen your brothers. I believe it was the face of, you didn't listen to me the first time. But remember the second thing. Turn. Repent. And you know what's powerful? Is it was Peter in Acts chapter 2 when he's proclaiming that Pentecost sermon. It was because he listened to the words of Jesus finally. After the rooster crowed. After Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. We know that he listened because he turned. He repented. Not like Judas who, who went and he hanged himself over his grief. That's not what God wants. He provides mercy so that we can repent. But if we miss that picture, we're missing the rooster crow. We're missing the warning call of that rooster in order for us to change. So many people say you can't change. So many people say that you can't repent. Well, that's the opposite of Scripture that's the opposite of what Jesus provides for us. And Peter's example is he remembered the rooster's crow. He remembered the wake-up call. And I wonder if he remembered it when Acts 2.37 took place, when they heard this, this being that this Jesus whom you crucified is both Lord and Christ, verse 36 of Acts chapter 2. Turn there with me. Acts 2 and verse 37, he says, When they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Did Peter know what it meant to be cut to the heart? Yes, he did. He saw the face of Jesus as he wept sorrowfully and went away. He knew what it was like to be cut to the heart. 
And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. You know, that means turn again. Peter says, well, I'm going to give you the advice that Jesus gave me. Turn again. Turn again. He says, I'm standing here today telling you you can. <laughs> because he did. He's saying, repent. Turn again. And then he says this, and be immersed, baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter received the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's saying it's a gift where Peter would have just said, how can I receive this? How can I have forgiveness? I denied that my Lord and Savior. I've prayed for you, Peter. I've prayed that Satan will not sift you like wheat. He will not treat you as chaff. You're the seed, and it is in fact through what you proclaim on that day that's going to establish the church. Peter gives us the example of how we too can overcome when we've denied Jesus. Why? Verse 39, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. God is calling you, and it may be through a rooster's call today. Because it's a promise to you and to me. We're the ones who are far off. We're the Gentiles, but we're also far off in 2,000 years' time. And it's the same call that was made on that day that is the call for you today. Do you need to come repenting of your sins, but repenting of, of the way that you think and saying, you know what, I don't know why he said to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. I wish that was a rooster call. That would have been perfect. But, you know, when it comes to this, this, this call, it is a call for all of us today to obey his word. Will you respond to the invitation we're about to sing? Let's stand and let's sing at this time.